You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Annika Scott. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent Cleveland, Ohio, 2006. After a chance encounter, three people soon find out that life can sometimes thrust us into the public eye, even when taking great measures to avoid it. Cooper Madison was the best pitcher in baseball, after being drafted number one overall in 1996 from the small Gulf Coast town of Pass Christian, Mississippi. One year after announcing his sudden and shocking retirement, he finds himself seeking anonymity in Cleveland, Ohio. Kara Knox is the youngest sibling to three older brothers. After a tragic work accident to her closest relative, she has built up a tough exterior as she begins her final year of college at Cleveland State University. Jason Knox, Kara's oldest brother, is the lead detective on Cleveland's Edgewater Park Killer case. After months without a suspect, he's feeling the heat from his media-hungry chief. Serendipity intervenes, and all three learn that perception and reality are paths that rarely ever intersect. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent. Hey folks, you really ought to check out Patricia Gillum's Heroes of Corvus uh, series. Uh, Book one is called A Superhero's Duty, a fight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the death of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city are not out of danger. A Superhero's Duty, book one of The Heroes of Corvus by Patricia Gillum. Get this series now. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today I am super excited to have my new friend Annika Scott on the show with me. Uh, we are, you know, four weeks in or so into, uh, you know, pandemic mode. And so as we've been trying to do here on Author Stories is bring 
a little light uh, into the world during these uh, tough times. And uh, Annika and I were just having a good laugh about our um, our lowered expectations now. And uh, but we're super excited to get to chat today. Welcome to the show, Annika. Thank you. Great to be here. Absolutely. Um, Annika, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, yeah. Um, I know the exact time. I was eight years old and had written a short story for school called The Ghost of Bentley Hall. Um And I remember writing that on the little lined notebook paper for school and turning it in to my teacher. And my teacher read it out loud to the class. And that was about the proudest moment of my life up till that time. And I kind of knew from then on, okay, this is the kind of thing I want to do, be recognized for for the stuff that I think up in my head. So the exact moment I remember. (laughs) I love that. So uh, did... Uh, were there more adventures with Bentley Hall or was this a one-off? That was a one-off thing. I think from there, I just kept, uh, just kept writing. I was kind of bored at school a lot. So I would write, um, little stories in the margins of, of whatever I had in front of me, you know, when the teacher's talking and I'm supposed to take notes and then, um, I would just do like the shape of the page, you know, in, in this rectangle back and forth and just keep writing in these weird, (laughs) you know, um, um, just in the parameters of the page in front of me. And, um, I would write all kinds of things, um, a lot of fantasy when I was younger. Uh, so it's weird. I didn't end up writing fantasy, but like the first story was a ghost story. Um, but somehow I kind of drifted into realistic stuff. So, yeah. Do you remember what the first fantasy story that just completely, you know, blew your mind, captured your imagination? The one that I read of of someone else's. Yeah, sure. I I absolutely loved the ghost of uh, oh God, ghost, no. The Mists of Avalon. Um which, you know, for me was not a real yeah, you could say it's fantasy, but it's not really. It's kind of but I loved that book enough that that was one where it kind of took me into other areas of fantasy. So I ended up reading, I think, The Wheel of Time and, you know, other sorts of um, cycles and series. So, you know, and and I did did eventually end up with um, the the entire Game of Thrones thing. But I read it before the TV stuff. And so, you know, at least I have that. Your, your, ner- your nerd credibility is intact. We'll thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> not like those bandwagoners, whatever. No, no, no. Yeah. No. yeah. Um, well, I find that very interesting. Um, do you feel like um, that the the fantasy that you read and um, uh, that you absorbed, uh, you now write historical fiction? Uh, which in a way can be sort of like fantasy because we're talking about the real world, but usually we're talking about a time where we didn't live, you and I, um, and there's probably a bit of world building that goes into that, would you say? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think um, one of the things that kind of brought me to to historical uh, novels um, was also via fantasy because I loved both. And I, I think probably it is the world building that happens in both that kind of drew me to that. So um, I ended up drifting to, to history more so because I just love, love history, love it. So and, and I have since I was a little kid. Um, and I think this ability to project yourself into a different world and uh, just comes easy to me. Um, and I prefer to do that. And sometimes I really prefer to live in my mind than here in the world we're in right now, (laughs) which is understandable at the moment. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, as a, uh, a kid who loved storytelling so much, uh, and, and loved books, um, what was your, what was your career path that you set out on? Because, you know, as we all know, um, writing isn't always a a clear path straight from school to, you know, I'm going to be a writer. Most of us 
you know, have adventures along the way? What what were uh, what were your plans uh, for career and and things like that? Um, I well, when I was writing uh, my ghost stories and things, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I think like all eight year old girls want sure. to be a veterinarian. <laughs> um, I I I pretty early thought I want to be a writer. I kind of knew that, but I didn't yeah. know uh, what that meant. And um, my parents were very practical people. They encouraged me a lot in because I was creative in various ways. I was also a musician my entire childhood up until I went to college. So, so I was in music and I was in dance and I wrote. And um, so you know, whatever creative outlet I was going to have, I thought that was something that I would maybe keep as a hobby because my practical side says, well, you have to learn something that makes money. <laughs> and so, right. uh, so I, I ended up studying, um, international politics because I, I thought I wanted to be either a diplomat or work for the CIA. So that, that was my career path. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, I I saw that little um, line on, on your bio that that you know you thought you might want to join the CIA, but but you you think that you would have been a horrible spy. What why do you think that yeah. is? Yeah, well, I I think uh, for a lot of reasons. Right now, I'm actually writing uh, my second book is an espionage novel or has a lot to do with espionage. So I've had to think about this, and I think that. I would have been a really bad spy in a way because I I don't like to be deceptive. I, I I'm a really honest person and I just would like to just say what is on my mind and tell people what I think. And um I was a journalist, I ended up being a journalist, and one of the hardest parts about journalism is that you can't normally say what you personally think you you put together the, the the story you distill the facts and those sorts of things and you but it's not your personal opinion you're putting out there normally uh and and i'm a really opinionated person and and i am a creative person i do like to make things up of course in stories but in my normal life uh i i don't think i could be that way as a person you know be a deceptive person and i think that's basically what you have to do in some ways, um, if you're in, you know, the, 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 the whole intelligence community, um, even up to the point where you just say, you can't tell your family the work you're doing, that kind of thing. And I'm like, I don't want to be that way. I want to be able to talk about what I do. So it, yeah. it's like everything is based around manipulating people. And that, mm. that just can't that can't be fun in the long term. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, even though the, the two things, journalism and, and intelligence work, they're both about gathering information. So so there was certainly uh, something there that that I could get a hold of and be interested in. I really liked I, I love political science. I love politics. But um, I ended up in college um, working for the State Department um, in Washington for uh, a summer internship. And that's where I was sort of my eyes really opened up about what I personally felt was important to me uh, for work, what kind of job I'd want to do, because um, there were things that I didn't always agree with. And um, I didn't like how you kind of had to toe the line. I, I just I'm just not that kind of person. So. So, yeah, <laughs> that was the end of my CIA career. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> well, you know, you. You, you, you've got that uh, that mark on your resume. That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was it that drew you um, initially to the the World War Two era and and, you know, slightly post World War Two? Um, this this book is so fascinating, so immersive. Uh, you know, I felt like I was there. Um, it it uh, it made me think about this time period and these these people, um, let's just put it that way, that the people involved in this in a way that that I've I've never been able to before. And I've always wanted to because this book raises questions that I've always wanted to explore and have never found the book that allowed me to do that in a way that this one does. Um, and, and Clara uh, Falkenberg is, is you know, the perfect character. Um, for this, but what what initially drew you to this time period, these people, 
and you know this this horrible war that uh that we're talking about in this book um when i was in school like maybe junior high school i think that's the first time we really started talking about world war ii um and i learned that world war ii started on september 1st 1939 and september 1st is my birthday so I think that probably was the little little thing that made me look into it a little bit more and, you know, or, or even just some sort of personal connection. Because before that, I didn't really know what did my family do in World War II or anything like that. I just didn't know. Um, but that maybe was the spark. And um, I just started reading everything I could get my hands on. You know, there's always been documentaries and things like that. Um I think also I loved the classic or now classic World War II thrillers um, like Eye of the Needle or The Key to Rebecca. Um, just just some of these absolutely brilliant thrillers that I was reading at maybe 16 or 17 years old that, ha that were set during World War II. I don't know. Something about it. Something about the kind of moral murkiness of the whole thing um was really appealing to me right at the beginning and then i uh just have read kept reading about it kept looking collecting things about world war ii over the years and um once i ended up in germany it seemed kind of a natural <laughs> a natural thing to do to write a book uh from from the german perspective uh once i once i was able to get to know the culture and, and you've lived there for, I, I think you told me uh, when we were talking earlier, a, a couple of decades now? Yeah, yeah. What brought been, you to Germany? I can't, I can't believe I've lived here that long. It's so, like, I'm not that old, am I? I've lived here 20 <laughs> years, you know? Well, you moved there um, when you were three. Uh, yeah, it, exactly. The math works out. I did. I did. <laughs> I actually got married, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my husband's German. So I, um, I moved here uh basically because it got too expensive to have a long distance relationship. So one of us had to move. <laughs> um, and I really, really love it here. It's, 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 it's a great country to live in. And, um, but it was very difficult at the beginning to learn the language because I didn't speak any German. Um, and I, I don't think I could have written uh, the German heiress uh, without knowing German, because there's so many sources that um, that are available only in, in German, because particularly the post-war era just isn't as well known to, to people. So there's not as much um, stuff that's translated into English that you can access. So. Um, one thing I'm fascinated by... Um... Uh, I have a uh, a good friend who is German. He uh, grew up in Germany and uh, immigrated to the United States a, a, about a decade or so ago. And um, I grew up in the American South, and you know we have our own uh, history of uh, you know civil rights struggles and uh, and, and things like that. Uh, as a, a kid who was born in the seventies, uh, I came just after all of that. So my parents' generation were the ones that, that had the, you know, front row seat for all of the, you know, the, the sixties turmoil oh, yeah. and, and, and all of that. And, yeah. you know, uh, I was, my generation was the first one to have integrated schools and, um, you know, we just, we grew up together as, as friends and, you know, n not to say that there's not latent racism and, and all of that stuff that we still deal with all over the world today but my generation had a very different experience than my parents' generation did. We, yeah. it, it was easier for us uh, because we were just always together. Um, and so, you know, I, I always wanted to hear the older people's stories. What was it like? What were, you know, what were some of the, the, the moral things that, that people were wrestling with? And, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by what, what makes society tick. So yeah. I'm, I'm having this conversation with my German friend and, uh, and you know, he's a, a couple of years older than me, but basically the same generation. And I said, well, your parents, you know, were the generation that came just after world war two. Um, 
you know, what were conversations like around your house? And, you know, how do the, the German people feel about what happened? And he said that no one in his village ever talked about it ever. Mm -hmm. Like it it was just not, not a topic of conversation ever. And I was like, oh, come on, surely, you know, when you're just around the table and stuff, because I know the conversations we had in my house. And, and he's like, no, it just, you know, we didn't talk about it. Um, Mm -hmm. so did you, you know, as someone who's curious, uh, and then in, you know, kind of integrating yourself into German culture, uh, you know, did, did questions start to come up for you and, and what was the exploration process like for you to scratch, you know, beyond the surface and to, to feel what the local people felt about what happened? I, um, I think that probably started with my husband's family. Um, I, once I was able to speak enough German, (laughs) you know, um, I think that you can't underestimate how important the language is, um, because people will trust talking to you more if you're, if you're doing it in their language and they know you're making that effort. So, so I had to get there and it took a few years for me. Um, but my husband's family did not speak English. Um, I should say his parents didn't speak English. And um, so they were one. His dad was born uh, during the war and his mother was born right after. And um, his father. So my father in law had memories of the war as a small child. And I would have really liked to have talked to him about it. Um, but at, at, in the beginning, I just didn't have the language. So once I could, you know, he just started telling me what he remembered. And these are some of his earliest memories. And he was willing to do it because I was willing to listen. And because I asked him basically just completely openly without any kind of, of blame or, or, or anything like that. And of course, you know, my in-laws didn't do anything wrong. They were, they were the generation that, that were born after the war or were children. So, so it wasn't any kind of personal attack. Uh, I, I was just open and just said, well, what do you remember? And what did you experience? And um, I, I can't remember if this is actually in the German heiress, but one of the memories that my uh, father-in-law told me was when he was a little boy um, and the, the bombs were, were coming, the Allies were, were bombing Germany. Um, they had to reinforce the, the basement, the cellar of their house. And they, they basically took, uh, went out and chopped down trees and, and put up these, these tree trunks in their basement to shore up the ceiling from the bombs. And that when he was a little boy, he's maybe four years old or five years old. And, and he thinks he's walking around in a forest underground. And when I hear something like that from somebody, that's the kind of little detail that, that sticks in my mind as a writer. And I just, I just kind of know that that is this, this, this color that you get only when you talk uh, to people. Um, and uh, reading oral uh, histories and only in the last maybe 20 years uh, did Germans really start to record their memories from from the war era, the people who could remember. Before that, they honestly did not talk much about it. That's true. Wow. Uh, so as you as you start thinking about writing a book about this, and that obviously came with, with a lot of, uh, you know, thought and, and mental preparation, um, how did you settle on on the character of Clara Falkenberger? Did she just come to you? What? How? How did she come to be? Uh, Clara came later than uh, Jacob and Willie, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. okay, nice. Uh, yeah, um, sometimes a story develops in ways you just can't predict. Um, so I had actually thought of this scenario really of of a boy who who refuses to believe that world war ii was lost and that he's been living in a coal mine uh underground because he's in hiding and he refuses to come out into the world so i sort of knew that really early that i wanted to do something with that um i knew he'd be found by someone and that's how sort of jacob came in uh, Jacob Relling. And uh, so so I had a kind of setup, but I knew it was too limited. It wasn't going to address 
all of the sort of moral questions and these these difficulties that that I really wanted to explore in the book. Um, I didn't want it to just be an adventure, even though there's a sort of adventure kind of atmosphere to, to some of the setup. But I was watching a documentary on German television one night, just happened to, to flip through the channels and find it. And it was about the uh, industrial families in Germany. There are many. And these are families like who run Porsche, the ones who run BMW and so on. Um, and what did those families do during World War II? And once I saw this documentary, I was like, whoa, I have to find out more about this and just just began to research and research. And Clara just completely, you know, materialized from this idea. That's what I was missing. What's this thing this story really needs? Um, it's someone in this in this world of of the industrialists because I wanted to set the story in Essen, and Essen is or was at that time, um, you know, what they called the Armory of the Reich. They built weapons here and uh, steel steel mills and you know locomotives and you know heavy industry. So I'm like, I know I wanted to bring that in, and um, then Clara. Uh, the daughter, a daughter of industry, you know, I decided I, I really want that kind of person in there. So I had to research what what did women do during the war? Were there women who actually took over companies or took over businesses while their <clears throat> while their uh, husbands were away or killed or whatever? And there are cases where that happened. And so I'm like, okay, I got it. This is this is the person that I want to start to to, to build the story around. And um, you know, then with Clara, I was able to start to explore, um, you know, some of these questions of, of, you know, your past and, you know, guilt and redemption and all that fun stuff. <laughs> right. There's, um, she's such a fun character because like I said, um, you know, I've, I've always wanted to explore what it must've been like for, uh, the people that were not personally politically connected or didn't have you know, um, an ax to grind or, or didn't feel, um, you know, necessarily, uh, patriotically motivated, um, or, you know, you, you know, the, the Clara it brings with her, uh, her own motivations and she's, she's kind of, um, a, a victim of circumstance. She's, she's, uh, this is, she finds herself in, in a place that is of n none of her doing. Um, so how does a person like that navigate this and what do they think about what's going on? And I, I really love that you chose to, uh, to, to not moralize through her, if that makes any, any sense. Um, you allowed, you, you allow her to, to just be her. And, and with that comes, uh, you know, all of the doubts and the fears and the, you know, um, all of the things that, that just a normal citizen would be going through when their country is doing things that uh, that they have no control over. Um, you know, as, as you start kind of sorting through all the things and, and finding her narrative voice, um, what was it like to, to walk in her shoes? I think that it's... Um really, it was difficult at first. And I was surprised because, you know, I'm a woman, Claire is a woman, I, I've, I had been in Germany by then long enough um, to feel well integrated here. Um, I come from an industrial family myself, I'm from Detroit, uh, or the Detroit area to be technical about it, um, and the car industry. And, you know, so grew up around factories and things like that. So there were so we had a lot in common, but um, I'm, I'm not an elite person, though. I wasn't like that. Right. But um, so Clara was 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 mysterious to me, even through the first drafts of the novel normally after maybe a, a couple drafts maybe three you kind of have a grasp at least of your main character right but Clara was really 
it, it was almost as if there's sort of smoke in front of her face um, all the time. And I knew what she was doing and it was hard to find out why. So one of the things I had to do over and over again through through the, the revisions of the book was just keep asking her, why are you doing this? And, and what made you be this way? Um, and, and those are... Those are that that's that sort of digging into the character took a lot of time and a lot of of sort of self-reflection because it's not me, it's her. And I'm trying to, to find out who is she. But she was a character who did not want people to know who she was. So it as the author, as the person inventing her, you know, I had to kind of struggle and, and get her to to show me you know, what, what she was and who she was. And that's how certain scenes, um, came up in the book or certain memories came up that she had, uh, that helped me understand, uh, who she is and why she turned out the way she was. For instance, one of the scenes from her childhood with her father and the Falcon, um, which to me, once, once I, I had thought up this, memory of Clara's a lot of things kind of clicked for me the we we talked to, about your love of um of espionage thrillers and uh you know how you would have loved to have been a spy un, until you actually had to do it um yeah and this <laughs> the the, Ger, the German heiress is is not an espionage thriller per se but it, it has that feel in a lot of places there's there's definitely a thriller tension um, to the book in a lot of ways. Uh, can you talk about kind of weaving those elements into the story and and how this, you know, this book could have been a very different book. It, it could have been, you know, uh, just a, uh, a a very literary um, character exploration, and that would have been an amazing book. Um, but there are there are definite thriller aspects to this book. Um, it, Talk about that a little bit, if you would, please. Okay. I actually thought up the book as a noir, um, as the original, really original idea. Um, and I, I can't really describe why. I just felt that that's, that's the, the – I mean, I love noir film, and, and I think that – uh, that kind of dribbled into the, <laughs> into the whole uh, – ideas at the very beginning. And, and I think there still is a very noir f feel to parts of the book. Um, however, I, I don't know, maybe it's just be a first novel. Sometimes in a first novel, you just put in everything you love. <laughs> and I, I, I love noir. I love adventure. I love, um, but also I love exploring some of these issues that we've been talking about. So I love character and I, I, I wouldn't, have wanted to write a straight sort of a, 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 a thriller like the ones I love. I love, like I said, the classic thrillers and, and things, but that's not really what I wanted to write. So um, balancing those elements was extremely hard. And I think that was probably the last thing that I hopefully got right um, in the revisions because I had to trim here or there, you know, when, when something was, I know that there are very b basic thriller elements here and there. There are things Clara does or things that happen because she is being hunted by a, uh, a British officer. That is a very cat and mouse, um, aspect of the book. And there's, that's bound to have certain kinds of thriller elements to it. But I really felt I wanted that there. I wanted the propulsion to be in the book because I didn't want it to be a kind of stick in the mud, um, dreary, um, a woman thinking about her past thing to, in, in, in that setting, it could have been too dreary. It could have been, yeah, just not as fun. And I, I like to read fun books too, <laughs> you know? So, so I really wanted to, 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 well, what I ended up doing is, is making this book that can, can be seen as a hybrid in a way. They say that there's that, that cross between literary and commercial no novels. And I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that as I wrote it. I, I just knew I liked this aspect of it, which may be more literary. 
And I liked the other aspect of it, which was more commercial or more, you know, in the in the crime thriller uh, vein. And and finding where those two things came together, I, I could not have done that without the help of my agent and my editors. What's so funny is as uh, uh, as I stopped talking and you picked it up, I scrolled down on the Amazon page for uh, for the German heiress, and the first category they have it listed under is espionage thrillers, which I oh, think really? is, is, is hilarious. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny. Um, oh, wow. I, I, I love this book so much. It is so full, full of twists and turns. Um, uh, Annika, what, what are you working on now after – you know, coming out with a book that is that is this uh, this exciting and uh, you know leaves us with uh, feeling like we've been on an adventure. How, you know, how do you follow that book up? Uh, that's hard. It, it's, <laughs> uh, I think. Don't they say second books are are the worst? Um, yeah, I I. I haven't experienced that yet with my second book. I I love my second book that I'm working on still, but I think I haven't hit that moment when the when my editors will will start to rip it apart for me. <laughs> so, um, so the pain is not there yet. Uh, but my second book is much closer to an espionage novel. Um, I I I wanted to stay in post war Germany for another book. So. I, uh, it's set in 1947 and, uh, it is set in Berlin and, uh, the main characters are, uh, two women. Both of them are Soviet officers in the, uh, in the Soviet military administration in Berlin. And, uh, one of the sisters is in the, uh, early version of the KGB. And the other sister uh, was an intelligence agent during the war, but is not anymore. She's uh, sort of went back to being a simple interpreter for the military government. Um, The book actually opens uh, in the 1950s. The, 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 The KGB sister is a relatively powerful woman and she is trying to get uh, her sister, her younger sister, freed from the gulag. The younger sister, who was an agent during the war, was put away for a very long time for crimes she committed in Berlin. And the entire book, uh, the two sisters tell very different stories about what these crimes were that the one sister uh, had committed in Berlin. And so this book is definitely much more related to espionage. However, it has so much to say about the uh, the boundaries and borders we build around different peoples and different cultures, because Berlin at the time was divided into four um, with the Americans, the Soviets, the French and the British. And uh the major crime that the younger sister committed was uh, having an affair with a British officer. And that was forbidden for Soviet personnel. So that's how I've kind of started building the story. And um, so you could probably hear that that's going to have some, you know, enough of the espionage side. But there's just going to be a lot about, you know, the, the dawn of the Cold War and um, deception and, um, you know, things along those lines. I'm really excited about it. And I I really need to get it done. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you do with that time period and, and with those events. That's, that's going to be amazing. Um, but right now, the German heiress is available everywhere now. It is amazing. I... I uh, give this my endorsement and I'm telling everyone they need to pick up uh, this book and uh, you know it's available in Kindle edition and audiobook you know if you're not uh, able to get to your local bookstore or order it from Amazon there's links to it in the uh, show notes of this episode uh, Annika if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do is there a place where they can connect with you online 
Yeah, um, my website is uh, www.annikascott.com. Um, I have a Facebook page as well, Annika Scott Author. I'm on Twitter, Annika Scott One. So just look wherever you can find me, and I'm there. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of the German heiress. Uh, Annika, this has been so much fun talking. Thank you for taking time to come on the show. Great. Thank you.